right, welcome everyone. And uh, welcome everyone who is joining us live on YouTube. We are lucky to have Bin To here today for our second seminar of the semester. And uh, Dennis has uh, volunteered to introduce Ben. So go ahead, Dennis. All right, great. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ben. So um, Ben has a uh, BS in life sciences from the National University of Singapore. Uh, and then after obtaining the, the bachelor's, he uh, did a master's in biology also uh, from the National University of Singapore. After that, he worked for five years as a research assistant in the Department of Biological Sciences um, at Singapore. Um, then he came to UF, so he started his PhD in 2016 uh, in SNRE. And, and while he was uh, doing his PhD, he decided to also uh, pursue and then eventually obtained actually uh, a master's in statistics, which is great. Uh, but not only that, while he was here um, during this period at, at UF, he has contributed significantly to uh, the broader community. So he has been an instructor for software data carpentry he founded, he created and coordinated the R users group here. So uh, for a while we were running uh, weekly R code clinics uh, in the library and he was instrumental for that. And there's still the, the UFR uh, mailing list that he helps to manage. Uh, during that period, he also was a executive board member at the Graduate Student Council. And he participated on a SFRC uh, faculty search committee. So helping us to identify a, a lecture. Um, so these are a couple of the services he's done while here at UF, but he also has service outside UF. So he's a member of the American Statistical Association uh, Inclusion and Diversity Working Group. Uh, he's a member of the Ecological Forecasting Institute, which is a, a group of folks uh, out of uh, Boston University. Uh, which is a really interesting group uh, focused on, on forecasting. Uh, I think what's most as outstanding is really not only sort of obtaining a PhD and a master's in stats and doing all these services. He also, if you look at his CV, he has 19 published uh, peer review articles, which uh, my perspective is that that's really way off the charts. So with that, uh, hopefully, uh, you guys will enjoy uh, his presentation, uh, summarizing kind of his PhD work throughout these uh, four or five years. It's all the floor is yours, Ben. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dennis. So as you can see from the title here, uh, today I'm going to talk about a disease, but it's not COVID-19. All right, uh, so the slides are available at this link. Um, so if you couldn't follow me or if you want to look at the slides in more detail, um, feel free to check out the link here. Okay, let's uh, dive right into it. Um, so a little bit of introductions to malaria. Uh, malaria is a disease that's caused by a protozoan um, parasite, Plasmodium. Uh, there are five species that can cause human malaria. And it is uh, known to be a uh, mosquito-borne disease, meaning that you have an infected mosquito uh, biting us and uh, we acquired the parasite from the mosquitoes. And then we pass the parasite to another mosquitoes and then the cycle goes on and on. All right, um, malaria has been with us for a very long time now. Um, but even until today, it's still a global public health threat. Uh, 230 million cases uh, in uh, 2018, resulting in 400,000 deaths. Um, two thirds of them were actually uh, children under five years old. So bear in mind on this uh, because uh, they are basically the, the, the most vulnerable group of people here. All right, so uh, today you can actually see uh, the disease across the tropics, uh, but 90% of the cases, more than 90% of, uh, of the cases uh, can be found in uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. 
the disease is uh, well correlated with um, environmental and some other social economic factors. Uh, for example, if you are living in urban area, if you are wealthy, you're much less likely to uh, get infected malaria. And we know that, you know, um, if people are sick, uh, let's not even talk about human or economic or conservation kind of development. Um, and yet uh, the problem with this disease is that it is affecting some of the poorest country around the world. Um, now we talk about models. So we have been using models to understand malaria uh, for a very long time. Uh, if you look at this graphic that I took out from the review paper uh, back in 2011, the first sort of uh, mathematical, you know, compartmental de uh, de deterministic model would be back, uh, can be dated back into 1911. But even in this paper, until now, you know, then uh, 20, uh, 2007, 2006, you still see more and more complicated uh, mathematical model being uh, created to understand the uh, disease transmissions. On the statistics side, which is my focus uh, for today, um, we use data, uh, of course, uh, to understand the current situations of malaria, for example, by mapping the malaria risk out onto a map to see where are the hotspots, where should we allocate our resources. We also use uh, statistical models and data to inform uh, clinical diagnosis of uh, malaria. And so uh, my focus, uh, my PhD research is focusing on the statistical methods and the applications that is born out of some of these methods. And this would be uh, the outline for my presentation today. They are basically uh, the title of three, the three chapters in my PhD dissertations, um, except for the interlude. Right, so um, for the first chapter, I go on to a large scale, you know, looking at national level uh, spatial mapping of malaria. And then for the second chapter, I look, uh, go down, you know, smaller level. Uh, looking at the spatial optimizations of local health facilities. And then finally, I create models, uh, you know, sort of go into the health facilities, create models to predict uh, causes of uh, childhood febrile illness. Okay, so first chapter. Um, as we all, uh, as I mentioned just now, um, malaria risk map is a very important uh, tools for decision makers. Um, in, in, okay, so this is actually Burkina Faso. This is a, a country, there is a, a West African country, highly endemic of uh, malaria. So say for example, uh, we have uh, based on national malaria survey data, uh, usually national malaria survey data go out to the ground and sample children under five years old and look for their malaria status. Um, why under five years old? Because again, this is the group that is most vulnerable to malaria infection. Okay, so you have a data like that, you know the point prevalence, the uh, you know, percentage of uh, kids that have malaria in each of these points. But it's not going to be very useful. Uh, what we kind of want is to have a smooth map like that, where we can uh, positively identify where are the hotspots, for example, up north, down south. What do we need to do in order to get a map like that? Well, we have data. We need to have, uh, usually we use uh, spatial predictors to uh, inform our models. Things like temperature, rainfall, nighttime lights, uh, urbanicities and things like that. And obviously we need a predictive model. Okay, so if you look at, look through the malaria literatures, uh, some of the most common approach uh, you, you always see in the literatures, uh, how do they use, to, uh, how, what, what kind of model they use to create the risk maps is usually the Gaussian process model. The idea is very intuitive you have an observed data point and the model says that, well, the points that are close to these observed data points in the middle should have similar prevalence. So in this case, for example, uh, the brighter the spots, 
the more correlated they are. And when the correlation level goes up, you can see that sort of the influence of these observed data points becomes larger and larger. Okay, so uh, pretty intuitive uh, kind of um, model, but the problem with the model is that it can be very time consuming to fit, especially when the sampling points are large, uh, you, you know, when you have hundreds or thousands of locations. So it is common to uh, approximate uh, this model using a stochastic partial differential equation, SPDE. And on top of that, using a method we call uh, integrated nested Laplace approximation in La. You're gonna hear me using these abbreviations a lot, SPDE in La. Okay, so um, I started out looking at, I want to create map um, and then I look into using SPD in La. The problem with SPD in La is that it's actually really complicated. It's a big stumping uh, barrier for, for someone to want to create a map using SPD in La. Say for example, these are the amount of code that you use to create, uh, to, to fit the SPD model. Problem is when you look at some of the alternatives, you only need like these amounts of code or even time to learn to use some of these alternatives. So then my question was, well, can we use some of these faster and simpler to use alternatives instead? Is it because that SPD is so much better, so much so that we have to use it, but uh, ignoring all the alternatives? And that would be the question for me for this uh, chapter. So I propose uh, two alternative models and I say, Let's compare the two alternative models with SVDE and see what happened. The first alternative models is a spatial smoothing using a generalized additive uh, model, GAM. So the idea of GAM is that, well, we assume that there's an underlying uh, smooth landscape uh, across the country. Uh, there's unexplained by the covariates that is informed by the data then we sort of uh, make predictions on top of this landscape. Another method that I proposed was uh, machine learning methods. Machine learning has been very, very popular in the predictive realm of, uh, of any, any, any you know, field. Um, you have statistical packages that, uh, that is, uh, you know, make fittings really quick and uh, you, know, you just need a few chunk of codes and that's it and you can get your results. So it's a suitable uh, alternative in this case, in my opinion, I chose uh, decision trees ensemble methods, again, um, um, popular machine learning methods that uh, include random forest, gradient boosting tree slash method, and GBM, you will hear me using GBM a lot here. Okay, so I got my proposed uh, alternative models, and then I was like, okay, let's answer an additional question here that I come up with uh, when I was doing uh, malaria risk mapping. Uh, more and more countries now have multiple years of uh, national malaria survey data. For example, in Burkina Faso, we have 2014 data. But if you look back at 2014, you can actually see that, well, we have an, an additional data set in 2010. Should we be able to borrow strength from 2010 data sets to help inform us on what's going on right now. So that uh, requires us to move from a spatial map setting, spatial settings with only one set of data to a spatial temporal settings, which, which include both sets of data. All right, so those are the two questions that I have, spatial versus spatial temporal settings and alternatives versus SPDE. And I'm going to uh, use model comparisons to uh, look out for some answer. All right, so I chose five countries, um, Mali, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Uganda, and Malawi. So all sorts of sizes in all, uh, all over uh, Africa. And I get the data from uh, these things called uh, demographic health survey is a publicly available data sets uh, uh, out there. And then, uh, well, as, as I've mentioned just now, we need spatial covariates. 
So I go on to some of the free and publicly available remote sensing or GIS products and extract some of these uh, spatial covariates, up to 10 of them, I think, or was it 11? All right, uh, as you can see some of them here. And the idea is model comparisons. I have five countries, four models, and two settings. You, you might have remembered that I say SPDE versus GAM versus GBM, uh, but I also included a stepwise logistic question, which is a simple model that acts as a baseline here. So this is the workflow, data, predictors, models, and then uh, we sort of use uh, this method called tenfold cross validations to assess the uh, predictive performance of the models. And finally, uh, we calculate some sort of uh, accuracy measure or performance measure in this case. Um, you are gonna see what are they in the next slide when we talk about results. Okay, so here is a, a little bit of walkthrough of the graphs that you see here. Uh, MAE is on the Y uh, X axis. Uh, it stands for mean absolute error. It's one of the performance measure. Log likelihood is another performance measure. And in general, we want MAE to be as small as possible. And we want log likelihood to be as large as possible. So points that are nearer to the top left corner is better. Points to the uh, bottom right corner is worse. Okay, so the round dots are, is spatial settings, no past data involved. And the plus that you see here, they are spatial temporal settings uh, with past data involved. Okay, so I'm showing the first graph here is Burkina Faso. You will see other countries in uh, the, uh, the slides after this. So you can see that over here, you can sort of infer that, well, GAM and SVDE were the um, better models compared to the other two. Um, what's really interesting here is that uh, SVDE, when you go from spatial settings to spatial temporal settings, the arrows pointing backward that means the performance actually deteriorated. Okay, in Uganda, again, we see the similar things. Uh, GAM is doing a good job, SVD is doing a pretty good job too, uh, not so much for the others. In Nigeria, it seems like SVD is the best, um, but also do have a look at the uh, scale here uh, and compared to the previous graphs, you can see that um, the points the three points here are actually very similar. There is a very small difference among the top models. And then in Mali, uh, totally different stories here. Um, you have a very interesting development for GBM. It goes from the worst in spatial settings to become the best in spatial temporal settings. And we see a similar trend in Malawi. Again, GBM is doing this giant leap forward kind of movement. Um, but additional to that, um, and um, quite sadly, uh, GAM is uh, actually doing a lot worse uh, compared to all the other models in this particular country, Malawi. Okay, uh, you might not be able to catch all the arrow movement just now. Uh, here is another way of looking at uh, spatial versus spatial temporal settings we are looking at difference in MAE. Uh, basically, the points that is towards the positive regions means that uh, spatial temporal inclusions of past data is better. And the points towards the left means that uh, spatial settings is better. As you can uh, immediately see here, GBM, uh, our machine learning methods, and GAM, GAM, uh, generally beneficial from having uh, spatial temporal settings from having incorporations of the past data. Not so much for SPDE as we witnessed just now with uh, in uh, the, the point, backward pointing arrow for uh, Burkina Faso. Okay, so those are the results. A little bit of summary of these results and a little bit of discussions. There's no single best models uh, and performance varies from setting to setting, country to country.
But still, we can sort of say that based on what we see just now, SBTE is a generally consistently uh, well uh, in terms of performance. Uh, problem is it doesn't gain much from um, incorporating past data. Uh, I did a little bit of deep dive looking at uh, the data, uh, the cr cross validations results and uh, some simulations. And I found out that uh, the key here is that past and present spatial dependency, when they are very different, when you try to force it using an SPDE spatial temporal settings, it, it's not going to end well. Now, on to GAM, I find that uh, GAM performance is generally very well. Um, it's good, uh, it's fast, and it's simple to use. And I think it's a very uh, formidable kind of uh, alternative to the SPDE in LA model, uh, especially under spatial temporal setting. Um, but we still cannot shake away the uh, problem with uh, GAM in Malawi. So I, again, I do a little bit of deep dive into that, and I found out that well, it is very likely that GAM is doing a poor job in um, irregularly shaped countries. Um, when you look at uh, parameter to root area ratios for Malawi is 8.7. For Uganda, which uh, GAM is doing the best job there uh, is 5.7. All right, and then uh, for GBM, uh, as you can see there, uh, the, the performance is actually very unpredictable. But it seems like it generally fits well when more and more data is available. So uh, it is possible that if we have even more years of data and uh, you know, we throw in more information into the model, it could be that uh, GBM can actually uh, uh, overtake uh, the positions of the other, the other models. Uh, a final take home message from the project, um, basically fit multiple models. The good thing about GAM and GBM is that it really doesn't take much more time, a few more seconds of your time, um, maybe a few more seconds to figure out how to fit the model. But in general, I think it's a good idea to do some benchmarking with some of these alternative models, uh, even if you were to stick with using SPD. All right, before I bombard you with uh, more research stories, uh, I thought of uh, to share these stories that I learned when I was doing uh, my quals and I find it uh, quite interesting. All right, so the most famous anti-malaria drug nowadays, thanks to COVID-19 is chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, you might know it. But it's not the most effective one. The state of the drug, uh, art drug today is actually artemisinin. Uh, it was first isolated by a uh, Chinese scientist, Tu Youyou, uh, back in 1972. And because of the discovery, uh, she got awarded um, Nobel Prize in Medicines in 2015 and earned herself a meme for being the most confusing person to sing Happy Birthday song to. Yeah, all right. So um, the Chinese words for artemisinin is Qing Hao Su. Uh, it literally uh, translated to extracts of Qing Hao. Qing Hao is actually a um, plant, it's, a, it's actually a herb. Um, it has been used as a traditional Chinese medicine. In fact, uh, in this book, Zhou Hou Bei Ji Fang, it's actually prescribed for malaria back in fourth century AD. And that is exactly how Tu Yo Yo uh, found out about uh, the, the plants and extracted artemisinin. Um, just thought this story is, uh, is very interesting for people like us who study ecology, study biology, uh, biodiversity, and, and for my friend who study uh, ethnobotanies. Okay, back to the track, back to a uh, second chapter here where I talk about spatial optimizations of uh, health facilities on a local level. All right, so imagine there are two communities here and health facilities nearby the first community. So uh, someone in the, this community got infected by malaria, got sick, had fever, and the good thing is, health facilities nearby, so they can actually walk to the health facilities. 
maybe 10 minutes walk, maybe uh, they hitch a ride with a neighbor, you know, take two minutes or three minutes to reach the health facilities. Great, and got diagnosed uh, malaria, get treated, clear their bloodstream from the parasite, go back home, becoming happy. Now, another person in these uh, far off uh, communities, not so lucky. The person got infected by malaria, but health facilities is far away, uh, maybe two hours of walk. Um, neighbor wouldn't be able to uh, send him to the clinic as well. So the parasite remain in this person's uh, bloodstream. There is a higher chance of the person uh, going into a severe malaria cases, uh, but also uh, there is also a higher chance for a mosquito come by, pick up the parasite and pass it to uh, the neighbor, you know, the community uh, around them, 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 them. And so you have a happy communities, you have a sad community just because of how the health facilities is placed. And um, I hope the little story conveyed the idea that early diagnosis and treatment um, not only reduce the chance of death, but also the transmission of the disease. There can be many factors that contribute to access to healthcare, but perhaps the most straightforward, you know, predictors, if as a modeler we want to come up with, would be the distance or the travel time to health facilities. And it has been shown to be important predictors uh, to malaria prevalence in some of these studies. So I'm interested in looking at these kind of a relationship a little bit more. And uh, that brings me to, uh, and because, you know, like a, a Usually when we look at access to healthcare, we look at local level kind of information more than national level maps that I created, for example, in my first chapter. So that brought me to uh, Bumpurugu Yunyo district. This is a district, uh, pretty small ones up uh, in the northern regions of uh, Ghana. It's uh, 1200 uh, kilometers square, uh, 150,000 populations. All right, the districts have um, two urban center. You can see here, Nakbanduri and uh, Bumpurugu. And there were uh, eight health facilities. Um, you can see that three of them are triangles. There is a label as a CHPS chips. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, more about that. But this district has uh, contributed us with uh, very high quality uh, malaria surveys data set uh, back in 2010 to 2014. Uh, my lab mate, Punam and Justin has been uh, working very extensively on this data set. In fact, uh, Justin uh, was uh, the person who actually come, first come up with the idea of uh, access to looking into access to healthcare and malaria prevalence here. Uh, so thank you very much for contributing to uh, my, my, my project uh, here. Um, but basically what they found is that distance to health facilities, uh, distance to urban centers, among other um, um, environmental factors were actually uh, important predictors to the mal malaria prevalence in this district. So then the question is, well, is it a good idea we just put a few more health facilities onto this district? Because then uh, you eff effectively reduce uh, distance to health facilities for many people and in some way drive down the malaria prevalence. And this idea is actually in line with our Ghanaian health strategy. So CHPS I mentioned just now uh, is actually stand for Community-Based Health Planning and Services, CHIPS. It's basically a community health post uh, which is run by trained community health officers they would work with the local communities uh, to provide healthcare services, including uh, treatment for malaria and other childhood diseases uh, to the community nearby. The CHIPS program uh, was uh, 
pretty successful and Ghana has been uh, working on expanding chips to all communities in the country. So that's great. And then it comes to the question of if we were to add more health facilities, more chips, um, what would happen uh, in terms of uh, malaria? Or perhaps some even more important questions, where should we place these new health facilities onto? So this is a sort of a spatial optimization problems. Basically say, for example, we want to add two health facilities. We usually set aside a criteria and we try to maximize or minimize the criteria uh, by, uh, by placing the two uh, health facilities onto uh, the area of interest. But before we go into talking about uh, this kind of optimization criteria, uh, we need to talk about prevalence and incidence, which are very important epidemiological term that I hope we all should know in this uh, pandemic era. Prevalence, uh, you can sort of loosely uh, translate it to the probability of a person in the area having malaria at a point in time. So prevalence would be something that range from zero to one, zero percent to 100 percent. Incidence is uh, quite different. Incidence, you can loosely uh, translate it to, be, to, uh, to, to define it as the number of cases during a given period in the populations of interest. So it's the number here, all right? Incidence is the number, prevalence is a uh, sort of like probability. Um, what we have, the available data based on all these like a malaria survey data, we can infer the prevalence and usually under five years old because they are the vulnerable group, as I've mentioned. But for decision maker, for someone who run healthcare operations, they might be interested more in incidence of all ages. If you prepare for drugs for these districts, for example, you want to know the number of cases of all ages. You're not gonna say, oh, I'm gonna prepare for drugs for the under five years old and gonna be ignoring all the other age groups, right? And of course you want to know how many cases so that you can prepare the amount of drugs that need to be delivered to the district. So oftentimes incidence of all ages become the decision criteria that we want, um, but we don't have, okay? And luckily um, there are studies out there that uses a meta-analysis studies from all over the places to make conversions from uh, prevalence under five years old to incidence of all ages. Bear in mind that it doesn't mean that those data is applicable to the local uh, context, but this is the best we have for now. Again, another bear in mind, prevalence conversions to incidence are not always linear, all right? Especially for older children and for adults, it's not linear. And that's why when we do this kind of spatial optimization exercise, we expect that if you optimize using malaria prevalence under five years old, it's gonna be different from uh, optimizing using malaria incidence of all ages. So this is uh, the objectives for this particular uh, chapter of mine. And I added a third criteria, a third optimization criteria, which is the average travel time to nearest health facilities. This is more like a, a uninfluenced by malaria kind of criteria. Okay, so um, again, as I say, we have, uh, thanks to our Ghanaian collaborators, high quality data, uh, three years. So I chose three years of high transmission season data ranging from 2010 to 2012. And in total, uh, there are um, 5,000 children uh, under five uh, were tested, were sampled. 71 to 80 villages uh, per year uh, were, uh, were sampled. And uh, I use a relatively simple model here, GAM with uh, five predictors, as you can see the five predictors here. Now the optimization process, I won't go into detail, but basically you want to specify the number of health facilities that you want, say for example, two or three. 
And then you specify the criteria. In this case, we want to minimize malaria prevalence, incidence, and also average travel time. And then we plug into this algorithm called a genetic algorithm, which will be able to find uh, the optimal locations of uh, these health facilities for us. All right, results. Now, the results is gonna be a lot of graphs, a lot of maps. Uh, I find it really difficult to present those results to you uh, using an interact, uh, using you know, static context, statics graph. And so I created a uh, shiny app tools here uh, to help us visualize it. Um, okay, got it. Um, yeah, just a little bit of plug here. Um, uh, our group actually uh, have written up a paper about using Shiny apps. Uh, it's a Shiny package in R that allows us to rapidly create uh, interactive tools to communicate our ideas in the conservation of biology. So feel free to have a look on that. So here is the how the interactive app look like. So here you have uh, Bungpurugu in your district, the eight health facilities existing ones. And here um, I can say, I want to look at travel time. Um, um, and as you can see here, uh, down south is where the travel time is high, uh, up to like two hours travel time to the nearest health facilities. Okay, so over here in, in this case, I can actually, uh, okay, there are a lot of pops up, pop up, sorry that I need to deal with. Okay, so here, um, say for example, I want to look at um, optimal locations uh, using average travel time per person as an as a optimization criteria. I want five health facilities. I can click optimize here and uh, my models is going to point me to the five uh, locations, the purple color that is being proposed here. You can see that uh, based on these criteria, uh, the model says you should allocate three health facilities down south, but two more actually up north. And as you can see here, well, there are so many you know, health facilities up north here. Why are we still allocating even more uh, health facilities up here? That is uh, very much to do with the underlying population distributions of the distri uh, district. If the population is, uh, there are more people staying up in the north, we still need to cater to uh, those people as well. So again, we can have a look at uh, prevalence and we can go down and change the optimization criteria to prevalence, click optimize. You can see again, the proposed locations are all sort of very similar to travel time. There's a little bit of disagreement. But when it comes to incidents, um, something pretty interesting here. Um, optimize. You can see that the proposed locations are now all up in the north. Okay. Um, if we go back to looking at prevalence, what happened here is that um, prevalence conversions to incidence is not nonlinear. It's nonlinear in such a way that in high, um, um, uh, in high prevalence area, uh, even if you make a lot of progress in reducing the malaria prevalence, uh, the incidence would not, would not budge, would not reduce. But in a moderate, moderately low um, um, prevalence area, when you uh, reduce the prevalence further, um, the incidence would also reduce. And as a result, the spatial optimizers say, let's stick to the northern part where the prevalence is uh, generally lower than the southern part. So I think this is uh, one of the major findings uh, for this exercise uh, to me really is that um, be careful of uh, what kind of criteria you choose. You might be enhancing the kind of uh, inequities uh, even within a small area like that. Now, these optimal locations and uh, things like that, um, it's nice to look at on the, on the paper. But um, the question here is um, sometimes we have logistical or political reasons. You might not want the positions to be there. 
Um, so the applications here, the great thing about it is that we can actually uh, base, you know, experiment with the model and click on the place we want to add health facilities, we add on it and click update predictions. And uh, you can actually see differences, for example, from the baseline. In this case, uh, the malaria prevalence actually reduced by as much as about 7%, 8%. Very good. So there are a lot more interesting things that you can play around with this app, um, but um, I got to go to go back to my presentations because I'm running out of time. So uh, feel free to play around with it if you have the link here. Okay, so um, the final chapter, uh, let me see what, okay. So the final chapter is on um, decision support tool. I go into looking at uh, creating models to predict um, causes of childhood febrile illness. Okay, um, malaria, it used to be that um, if you have a kid that comes into the clinic that says they have fever, basically fever is a, is a, a more common term for febrile illness. Um, and you, you, you can say for sure that, uh, you know, with quite a lot of uncertainty that, oh, well, the kid has malaria. Not so much in the uh, past decades or so, when the malaria transmissions, now we, we, we're making a lot of progress in driving down uh, the malaria transmissions in Africa, other etiologies uh, become more and more important and prominent, things like bacterial infection. The problem with these etiologies is that they are even harder to diagnose, especially in a remote and resource limited area. Okay, so um, it has been there, there has been a proposal to talk about. Well, then shouldn't should we use um, things like symptoms, demographic variables, and sometimes even hematological variables like white blood cell, red blood cell hemoglobin to make predictions about infection status. So we want to have a predictive model to do this. So um, basically the idea here is I want to create a predictive model. But the thing is predictive model, you can create predictive model and let it sit there and do nothing, right? Predictive model is only useful when we can actually use it. So my idea here is I want to go one step further and create an interactive tools that inform health practitioners using uh, the predictive probability. I'm going to demonstrate the app first um, before I go into the meat of, uh, of these two. Okay, a little bit of running time. So yeah. Now on the left hand side is the input panel. On the right hand side is the output panel. Um, the data that we got uh, from uh, our Ghanaian collaborators, so they actually go into two hospitals, one in Accra, which is the capital regions of the country, and Kintampo, which is the uh, uh, rural area in the middle of the country. Uh, they collected data there, so that's why, um, say for example, I imagine myself as a health practitioner, a kid come into the clinics, complain about having fever, and I am here putting out information on the left-hand side and see what is the predictive, uh, predicted probabilities of some of the diagnostic tests. So yes, rainy seasons, we are still in September, um, three to five years old, for example, um, 38 degrees Celsius, for example. And uh, the kid has headache, has uh, vomit, diarrhea, chills, maybe no cough, okay. And um, all the other questions I did not ask the kid, so uh, leave it blank, leave them as NA or uh, missing in this case. So, and I can click calculate. And then I get some output like that. Okay, the blue color is the baseline at location. That means uh, we given only the information of where we are, and whether or not there's a rainy season going on, uh, this is the predicted probability of positive malaria RDT. RDT stands for Rapid Diagnostic Test. So this is the positive, uh, uh, average uh, positive, uh, you know, outcome, uh, uh, predicted probability. And as you can see here, 
by adding all this additional information, now the kid has 68% chance of uh, uh, having a positive malaria RDT results. Likewise, for malaria microscopy, another way of uh, diagnosing um, malaria, 33% up to 59%. And for urine culture, 36% up to 55%. This is uh, to diagnose uh, ure urinary tract uh, infections. Okay, so that is the um, decision support tool that I want to have. And I want to create a model to be incorporated into this kind of decision support tool. It should be able to accommodate missing data. The user experience should be good enough. It should be fast, it should be small, it should be flexible. It should be accurate. We don't want to do bad predictions. And finally, I think it's very important that we don't do something black box. Uh, we want to be able to tell our, the user, this is what happened inside this tool. Right? We don't want to say that, oh, well, there's magic going on, so be it. So that is the idea of this chapter. I want to create a model that can simultaneously impute missing variables, make predictions, and how, how am I achieving that? I'm doing it using a Bayesian model averaging uh, mo by modifying it. All right, I'm sort of uh, running out of time, so a little bit uh, breeze through uh, some of these slides. Data coming from our Ghanaian collaborators is a case control studies, uh, meaning that in each of these hospitals, um, half of the children were recruited because they have fever, half of the children were recruited because they did not have fever. Okay, I, each of these ch ch uh, kids were collected, uh, given diagnostic tests of malaria, RDT, microscopy, and a PCR method. Uh, called Tagman array card. It's expensive, so it's only subjected to about 200 children. If the physician says so, we also give a blood and urine culture tests. These are the suites of uh, predictors. The problem is that uh, there are missing values in uh, many of these predictors. Not super severe, but we don't want to lose the information here. All right, I basically create a model the model would gel together two parts. The imputation part, uh, which is uh, which I assume that the covariates comes from a multivariate uh, probit slash normal distributions. And then there is the prediction part, which is the Bayesian model averaging part. Um, um, the good thing about Bayesian model averaging is that uh, we actually get a predictive in, uh, predictor importance measure, which is super useful when we explain it to uh, health practitioners. And prediction side, um, data comes in, you can see that sometimes you have missing value for uh, some of the covariates, doesn't matter, my model do the imputations and do predictions after that. Okay, I didn't really have time, so I'm just gonna close these chapters with uh, the key findings. Uh, I found that my model is uh, as, as accurate as uh, uh, a machine learning technique, random forest, which is super powerful. But in this case, I think my modified BMA methods is better because it did not lose the uh, interpretive, uh, interpretabilities of the model. Uh, and finally, you can see that uh, I have incorporated into a decision support tool and uh, it works. Okay, so here are some of the references for the slides and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dennis Valley, my uh, advisor, um, for you know being super helpful uh, throughout this journey. Uh, committee members, Dr. Nikolai Bizniuk, uh, Dr. Roa Dinersons, and also Dr. Tom Vladish, they have been super supportive and helpful also with my PhD project. Um, Ghanaian collaborators who have entrusted me with uh, their data to uh, do some interesting analysis out of it. Uh, Let me, who has uh, sit through my horrible presentations and read through my uh, manuscripts for me, being general uh, emotional supports as well. And finally, family and friends from in Florida, in Malaysia, in Singapore, uh, they have been super supportive, uh, making sure that I'm always well fed, uh, well hydrated, and all kinds of well spirited as well. 
All right, and uh, thank you very much. Um, my PhD defense is uh, actually one slightly more than one month away from now. So I very, very appreciate if you can give me some feedback, comments or questions. We can, uh, if we cannot do it right now, uh, you can always email me at this address. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, for that awesome presentation and for opening up your app and showing us how that works as well. Uh, we do have one comment on YouTube from Rich Tate, and he says, shout out to the ethnobotanist. Here's to you, to you, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? I know we have, we're at the end of time, but we can take a couple minutes um, and it would be great if you guys ask some questions of Ben. Feel free to unmute your mic or type in the chat box. I have a question. All right. Um, first, great talk. That was really interesting. And I, I really like the, uh, uh, the app that right. you, you can actually show your, your data interactively. That's really neat. Um, one question that I had was in the first chapter, you talk about the um, I think the GAM model, the GAM yeah. model, doing very well, except for with odd border shape. Right. I was wondering if you were able, obviously, I don't think you have like all the country data surrounding, but I was wondering if you're able to kind of work around the border shape, because if, if you're just trying to find where malaria is prevalent, then, then you, it doesn't have to be country specific. So yeah. you could kind of look at the, the surrounding area and include that in the analysis. And then it seems like if that's the limiting factor, then yeah. it solved a lot of the issues. Mm -hmm. um, so just to show you um, how the country look like. So Malawi has this like a uh, elongated shape uh, um, down here. And that's why I say it's irregularly uh, shaped. And yes, um, one, one of the idea that I have um, that I didn't go into was um, well, if there is actually surrounding countries where we also conducted some sort of malaria survey, we can sort of borrow data from the border as well to do that. Um, is something interesting to look at, but um, that would mean that we have to hope that um, other countries also conducted malaria survey during the same period of time. Um, I'm not sure if there is any uh, neighboring countries uh, that do that. Um, so I couldn't really uh, answer you the questions, but yeah, that would be something interesting to look at. If, uh, if, if, um, if we do have neighboring countries having similar data sets, that would be really helpful, I think. Yeah. And we have a similar question from Edmund Basham watching on YouTube. He says, can these apps be easily applied to other locations and countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, obviously um, the codes, I mean, for, for, for all of my work, um, the idea is to have the codes available publicly and um, perhaps also a small tutorials where uh, people can uh, uh, to, to talk about how you can plug in your own data. So obviously the best way to do it is uh, there is actually an interface where you can just plug in your data and then spit the output out. But uh, that, that would be uh, lose some of the uh, country specific contacts. Some, some countries need to have an additional way of uh, dealing with some of the problems. So uh, won't be able to do that, but uh, hopefully with the codes and the ideas available out there, uh, people can easily, uh, you know, remodify or repurpose some of my uh, work and to adapt to their countries. Any other last questions for Ben before we wrap up today's seminar? Yes. Hi, Ben. Hi. That, that was an awesome presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Hi. Thank yeah, you. I, I have a slight question. Uh, my, my main question is what informed your, your choice of country? Is, is it the data availability or, or what? Another thing is what can we learn from countries like Mozambique? I know Mozambique is mm. got a lot of malaria, it's, right. it's bad. And a country like Eswatini, which is a little south of Mozambique, mm. 
it managed to get rid of uh, malaria, malaria. Yeah. A few years ago. So what can we learn for, from those? Yeah. So, um, so first questions, um, um, basically is because of the data availabilities. Um, I started this out back in 2016, 2017. Um, of apparently there are more and more data available for other countries as well for the past few years. But back then, uh, I'm looking at specifically countries with at least two sets of data, and these are the countries that comes up with that. So those inform my uh, choice of countries. I would have loved to do it more, um, but you know, at that point of time, there, there, there weren't that many. So the other questions is interesting ones. Uh, you have uh, Mozambique. Um, so if you look at the global malaria map here, Mozambique uh, having a lot of uh, malaria, but not so much of uh, countries like Swatini. Um, um, I you know, honestly won't be able to answer much about it because I didn't really look into uh, Mozambique. I know uh, some of my lab mates who now work with uh, Malaria Atlas projects has been looking at that. Um, but one thing for sure, um, as you can see here, malaria seems to have a distribution um, that is, you know, not really going down to the temperate zones. So I'm not sure if, is Sotini uh, somewhere nearer to the temperate area? Um, not really. Not really. Oh, okay. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know much about uh, how exactly one country has malaria, but not the other countries. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, urbanizations. Um, you know, malaria used to be everywhere in the world, uh, but um, so most part of the modern, uh, so industrial, industrialized um, Europe, you know, uh, Northern America has uh, got rid of uh, malaria, mainly through uh, very, very powerful insecticide. So um, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, something happening here as well. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today's seminar. Thank you so much, Ben, for the presentation. Thank you very much for and having me. <laughs> we'll see everybody else uh, next Monday. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.